In this presentation, we are going to look at the book of 3 Nephi, chapters 8 through 11. So let's take a look at some of the doctrines and principles that are taught in this book and how they help us come unto Christ. 3 Nephi 8 through 11. First, we start off with 3 Nephi chapters 8 through 11. The following chart is a continuation of what President Ezra Taft Benson said about the books in the Book of Mormon just prior to the Savior's visit to the Nephites, being parallel to the Savior's second coming. El President Benson, quote, said, The record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. We've been doing this for the last several presentations, and so here's the final installment of here are some of the signs of Christ coming to the Americas that will parallel our day. So let's take a look at them. So in 1 Nephi 3, 8, the event or sign is there will be an, or there was a major earthquake. That did happen. That will happen again in Revelation 6. Number 2, 3 Nephi 8, 23-25. The sign there was great mourning over the destruction of the wicked. That will again happen in DNC 112, 24. Number 3, 3 Nephi 9, 13 and 10. The sign was the righteous survived the destruction of the Savior's coming. That again will happen according to 1 Nephi 22 and DNC 97. Number 4, 3 Nephi 9 and 11, the event or sign that happened was the voice of the Lord was heard by the righteous. That will happen again according to DNC 43 and 45. Number 5, 3 Nephi 9, 11, and then 12. The sign or event was current laws fulfilled and new laws instituted. I'm sorry, that should be and. So the fulfillment of the law of Moses and current laws and new laws instituted. That again will happen in Revelation 21, D.C. 101. Number 6, 3 Nephi 10, 2. The sign event was there's a period of silence. That again will be repeated in D.C. 88, 95, Revelation 8, 1. Exactly what that means, I have not found a good explanation yet. The, the period of silence. Number 7, 3 Nephi 10.10, 10, great joy was felt among the righteous in the Book of Mormon prior to his coming. Moses 7, DNC 133, that will happen again. And then number 8, 3 Nephi 11.8, Jesus descended from the heavens. DNC 88 and Joseph Smith, Matthew 126, Christ will again descend from the heavens. So there are some of the events or signs that did happen in the Book of Mormon that parallel what will happen prior to Christ and at Christ's second coming. So with that, let's now turn our attention to 3 Nephi chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, performing miracles in the name of Jesus. Nephi noted that there was not any man who could do a miracle in the name of Jesus, save he was cleansed from every wit from his iniquity. The following story told by Elder Von J. Featherstone while serving in the presiding bishopric illustrates the need for priesthood holders to be pure at all times. Elder Featherstone said, quote, People cannot hide sin. You cannot mock God and hold the whole Lord's holy priesthood and pretend to propose that you are his servant. I know of a great man who held his son dead son in his arms and said in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood I command you to live and the dead boy opened up his eyes this great brother could not have possibly done that had he been looking at pornography pieces of material a few nights before or if he had been involved in any other transgression of that kind the priesthood has to have a pure conduit to operate End of quote. 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that although not every priesthood administration will result in a miraculous event, only those who are worthy can perform miracles in the name of Christ. Priesthood holders must keep themselves pure and clean. Elder Holland said, quote, Now my young friends of both the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, not every prayer is answered so immediately, and not every priesthood declaration can command the renewal or the sustaining of life. Sometimes the will of God is otherwise. But young men, you will learn, if you have not already, that in frightening, even perilous moments, your faith and your priesthood will demand the very best of you and the best you can call down from heaven. Your ironic priesthood boys will not use your priest in exactly the same way an elder uses his, the Melchizedek priesthood. But all priesthood bearers must be instruments in the hand of God. And to be so, you must, as Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. You must be ready and worthy to act. End of quote. Chapter 8, verses 5 through 19. Physical upheaval testify, upheavals testify of Christ. A great and terrible tempest such as never had been known in all the land unleashed untold natural destruction. We learn through Nephi 8, 6 through 7. These physical upheavals were signs in America witnessing the crucifixion of the Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Some physical upheavals in our day signal the approaching of the second coming. These scenes are of value to us, not alone because they detail the events on the American continent some two millennia ago, but also because they typify what lies ahead. A study of 3rd and 4th Nephi is of an estimable worth in our coming to understand how to prepare for the second coming of the Son of Man, and also what life will be like during the millennium. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles cited the increase of major earthquakes as one of the signs of the second coming. Quote, signs of the second coming are all around us and seem to be increasing in frequency and intensity. For example, a list of major earthquakes in the World Almanac and Book of Facts 2004 shows twice as many earthquakes in the decades of the 1980s and 1990s as in the two preceding decades. It also shows further sharp increases in the first several years of this century. The list of notable floods and tidal waves and the list of hurricanes, typhoons, and blizzards worldwide show similar increases in recent years. Increases by comparison with 50 years ago can be dismissed as changes in reporting criteria, but the accelerating pattern of natural disasters in the last few decades is ominous. End of quote. See, brothers and sisters, the non-believer and the wicked will just blame it on global warming or climate change. No, God will increase national disasters to get our attention, to get us to repent. If you want to affect climate change, then let's keep the Sabbath day holy. Let's serve God and Him only. That is what will affect climate change, is righteousness in God. Chapter 8, verse 5. The phrase, in the first month, or on the fourth day of the month, it seems reasonable to assume that with the change in the reckoning of time among the Nephites, based now upon the signs of Christ's birth, the first month would be the month in which the sign was given. Mormon's account indicates that the signs of Christ's death came on the fourth day of the first month. Since we know that Jesus was crucified in the spring at the time of Passover, we concluded that Jesus was born in the spring, as we have been taught in the restored church. Chapter 8, verse 8, the city of Zarahemla did take fire. Five years before the birth of Christ, Samuel the Lamanite prophet, preaching from the walls of the city, prophesied the destruction of Zarahemla by fire if it continued in its wicked course and if its inhabitants drove the righteous from it. Drenched in the blood of the prophets, Zarahemla was now being rewarded according to its works. Chapter 8, verse 19, the phrase, the space of three hours. Christ hung upon the cross for a period about six hours from approximately 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. It was during the last three hours that darkness covered the land as apparently the agonies of Gethsemane returned. Of this period, Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, quote, He will continue to suffer the 
curses of crucifixion for another three hours until around 3 p.m., when he voluntarily gives up the ghost. Of these coming hours, Matthew and Mark say only that it was a period when there was darkness over all the land. Luke extends this turning of day into night over a greater area. There was darkness over all the earth, he says, and the sun was darkened. The fact of the darkness for which there is no known scientific explanation is known to us, but its purpose and what happened during those three seemingly endless hours remain outside the bounds of our understanding. Could it be that this was the period of his greatest trial, or, dur or that during it the agonies of Gethsemane reoccurred and even intensified? That this darkness did cover the whole earth we summarize in the Book of Mormon account. The Nephite prophets had spoken messianically of three days of darkness that would be a sign unto them of the crucifixion of Christ. At that time the rocks would rain and there would be such upheavals in nature that those on the isles of the sea would say, The God of nature suffers. The Nephite record tells of the fulfillment of the prophecies, of the darkness and storms and destructions that then occurred, of cities sinking in the sea, of mountains and valleys being created, of the rocks rending and the whole face of the earth being deformed. It is of more than passing import that the storms and the tempest and earthquakes lasted for about the space of three hours, and then there was darkness upon the face of the land. End of Elder McConkie's quote. Chapter 8, verses 20 through 25. These three days of darkness obviously accorded with the three days that the body of crucified Christ lay in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. How appropriate that the lands of the Book of Mormon be draped in darkness to commemorate the death and suffering of their king. The coming of light each morning ought to be a reminder to all of the manner in which our Redeemer brought an end that long night of darkness we associate with death, and ought also to be a reminder of the promise granted us through him of a newness of life. On the day of his resurrection, after Christ had overcome death, light came again to the people of America, signifying Christ's victory over death and darkness. Chapter 8, verses 24 through 25, Rejecting the Prophets Brings a Suffering. Just as in ancient times, rejection of the prophets today leads to suffering. President N. Al N. Eldon Tanner of the First Presidency compared the suffering of the saints in America during the destruction following the Savior's death with the destruction in our day of those who choose not to follow modern prophets. He said, quote, Today the world is rejecting the message of the prophets of God. Is it not true that there is weeping and wailing over the face of the land because men are at war with one another? Do we not have among us many who lament the waywardness of their youth and the tragedies that befall them as they turn away from righteousness and suffer the consequences of tampering with alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and other forbidden things? How many mourners do we have as a result of the lawlessness that is extant in our communities? We need to heed the lessons from the history of the past, lest we be consumed as were some of those earlier civilizations. This was the message Christ brought to those early Nephite people. End of quote. Let's now turn to 3 Nephi chapter 9. Chapter 9 verse 10, the phrase, Because of their wickedness in casting out the prophets. It is significant to know the Lord's definition of the wicked whom he had caused to be destroyed. While he could have a recited an extensive listing of their abominations, the Lord simply cited their rejection of the living prophets whom he had sent unto them to cry repentance. This phrase seems to be saying that most, if not all, of the wickedness of the world and individual iniquity could be averted through the heeding of the words of the Lord's living prophets. And so a definition of who the righteous, we always talk about the righteous. This will happen to the righteous. The righteous will be blessed. Well, who are the righteous? If the wicked are those who cast out the prophets, the righteous are then are those who heeded and come unto the prophets and follow in their ways. Chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, the righteous versus the wicked. 
Hugh W. Nimbley wisely pointed out, the righteous are whoever are repenting, and the wicked whoever are not repenting. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee who gave thanks to God that he was not a crook or a leecher, that he fasted twice a week, paid a full tithe, and was very strict in his religious observance. All this was perfectly true. The other man was a tax collector and rather ashamed of some of the things he had done. And instead of thanking God by way of boasting, he only asked God to be merciful to him, a sinner. The surprise is that the sinner was the righteous one because he was repenting. The other one who exalted himself shall be abased because he was not repenting. None but the truly penitent are saved, and that is who the righteous are. Great definition. Chapter 9, 13. Return unto me and repent of your sins and become converted that I may heal you. The Savior is often referred to as the great physician because of his miraculous ministry of healing all manner of infirmities. The Gospels are replete with examples of his healing the sick and infirm, giving sight to the blind and even raising the dead. Each example is miraculous indeed, but he is the great physician in a more significant way. The scriptures teach that sin induces a sickness of the spirit that is often linked to the physical pains and discomforts. Elder Boyd K. Packer spoke of this link between the sin-induced spiritual sickness and the physical body. Quote, there is another part of us not so tangible but quite as real as our physical body. This intangible part of us is described as mind, emotion, intellect, temperament, and many other things. Very seldom is it described as spiritual, but there is a spirit in man. To ignore it is to ignore reality. There are spiritual disorders, too, and spiritual diseases that can cause intense suffering. The body and the spirit of man are bound together. Often, very often, when there are disorders, it is very difficult to tell which is which. End of quote. The Savior's statement to the remnant Nephites and Lamanites is not merely symbolic, but also literal. Through faith in him and repentance, Sick, sin ridden souls are healed by the great physician as much as bodies were in the cleansing of lepers. The Savior's healing declaration, Be thou clean, is a literal promise to the faithful and repentant. It may be that all of the miraculous healing performed by Jesus were but tangible symbols of the greatest healing that he alone could perform, the healing of sick spirits and the cleansing of sick, stained souls. The greatest miracles I see today, declared President Harold B. Lee, aware are are not, I'm sorry, that should be, are not. Are not necessarily the healing of six bodies, but the greatest miracles I see are the healing of sick souls, those who are sick in spirit, soul and spirit, and are downhearted and distraught on the verge of nervous breakdown. End of quote. Before I move on, if I had a choice between having my physical healings miraculously taken away or being cleansed spiritually, I would be willing to suffer some physical elements and have my spirit and body cleansed through repentance and the forgiveness of Christ. 9.14, come unto me. Jesus promised, blessed are those who come unto me. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland explained the meaning of this invitation, how it applies in our lives. Quote, come, Christ says lovingly, come follow me. Wherever you are going, first come and see what I do. See where and how I spend my time. Learn of me, walk with me, talk with me, believe, listen to me. In turn, you will find answers to your prayers. God will bring rest to your souls. Come, follow me. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 15. I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. President Joseph Philly Smith declared, under the direction of the Father, Jesus Christ created this earth. No doubt others helped him, but it was Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who, under the direction of his Father, came down and organized matter and made this planet so that it might be inhabited by the children of God. End of quote. We know from the temple that Michael, who later becomes Adam, 
was some of the others who helped Christ in that organization of this earth. Chapter 9, verse 18, I am the light and life of the world. This declaration of the Savior, which was also understood by his disciples in the old world, should not be viewed as merely symbolic. This statement is not only a powerful declaration of his divine sonship and of his, and of his being the fulfillment of ancient prophecies concerning the true light of the Messiah, the Enlightener, but is also something more. The Savior, in a very, liter in very literal way, is the light and life of the world. This is from DNC 88. He that descendeth upon high, and also he that he descended below all things, in that he, this is referring to Christ, comprehended all things, that he might be in all things and through all things, the light of truth, what truth shineth. This is the light of Christ, and he also is in the sun, in the light of the sun, and power thereof by which it was made. As also he is in the moon, and is the light of the moon, and the power thereof by which it was made. As also the light of the stars, and the power thereof by which they were made. And the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. And the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighten your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. The light which is in all things things, which give us life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sits upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Truly, Christ is literally the light of all things, not just symbolically. In some incompre incomprehensible way, not only is the Savior the light of the world, as the perfect exemplar, exemplar and the life of the world, in that his atonement yields immortality and eternal life, but his power also ensures life and light to all creations. He is the source of all light, life, and truth. Without the light of Christ filling the immense of space, we would all die in darkness. Chapter 9, verse 18, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The use of the terms as titles of the Lord Christ has a dual application. First, they are used to imply the eternal nature of Jesus as a member of the Godhead, or as the scriptures refer to him, the Eternal One. This indicates that he is an everlasting and eternal being in whom all fullness and perfection dwell. Second, the phrase, the beginning and the end, has reference to the atonement in that Jesus is both the beginning, or author, and the end, or finisher, of the salvation of men. Elder Bruce R. McConkie observed that Christ is not only the author of salvation, if that means the innovator of the plan of redemption, but rather he is the cause thereof, that is, salvation is possible because of his atoning sacrifice, and that he is the leader in the cause of salvation. Chapter 9, verse 19, the phrase, Ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. In declaring that the law of Moses is fulfilled, the Savior was not reciting the eternal law of rescinding the eternal law of sacrifice, but rather was declaring that the specific practice or instructional methodology employed earlier was no longer in effect. From the days of Adam to Moses and from Moses to Jesus Christ, animal sacrifices were used to symbolically point towards the future atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Abinadi spoke of such sacrificial rites and the accompanying cardinal codes as types of things to come. Inasmuch as the Savior had already shed his blood and drank of the bitter cup in Gethsemane and on Golgotha, and had broken the bands of death and coming forth from the garden tomb, a new day had now dawned that required new symbolism, a new type of sacrifice, and new instruction in the eternal meaning of the covenant of sacrifice. Although the objective or instructional purpose of animal sacrifice and burnt offerings was now fulfilled in Christ, the saints understand that as part of the restitution of all things, such sacrifices will be reinstituted at least for a season. 
So animal sacrifice, not the law of Moses, but animal sacrifice that Adam performed and others prior to Moses. Those kind of animal sacrifice must be restored sometime as a restitution of all things for at least a time. So that is something that still has yet to be fulfilled and to be restored. Chapter 9, verse 20. Ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. The practice of sacrifice that was fulfilled in Christ was one of rites and rituals where the new practice commanded of the Lord involved inner attitudes that would bring about outward obedience to the commandments and ordinances. Just as the sacrifice of animals were to symbolize the shedding of the blood of Christ to focus the faith of the people on the Messiah, so must our obedience stemming from a sacrifice of a broken heart and contrite spirit be centered solely on Christ. What then is a broken heart and a constrained spirit that is to be our living sacrifice to the Lord? It is, as Paul taught, a godly sorrow, which worketh a repentance to salvation. It is much more than just a repentant attitude. It includes a recognition of total dependency upon the Lord for salvation and a willing submission to him and his laws. Lamoni's father characterized this sacrifice with his desire to come to know God when he declared, I will give away all my sins to know thee. Offering a sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit requires giving away our sins through faith in Christ, sincere and complete repentance, obedience to the Lord's commands, and pressing forward with a steadfastness in Christ. Even though animal sacrifice and burnt offerings were to be done away, the Lord did not intend the law of sacrifice, did not end the law of sacrifice. Using 3 Nephi 9.20, Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that today the Lord requires sacrifice of a different nature. Quote, the Savior said he would no longer accept burnt offerings or of animals. The gift or sacrifice he will accept now is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. You can offer the Lord the gift of your broken or repentant heart and your contrite or obedient spirit. In reality, it is the gift of yourself, what you are and what you are becoming. Is there something in you or in your life that is impure or unworthy? When you get rid of it, that is a gift to the Savior. Is there a good habit or quality that is lacking in your life? When you adopt it and make it a part of your character, you are giving a gift to the Lord. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 20. Him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Baptism by fire is the baptism of the Spirit, the reception of the Holy Ghost that cleanses one from sin and makes one a new creature. Did you catch that? It's the Holy Ghost that cleanses us from sin, not baptism. Let's stop teaching that the symbol of baptism is washing away of sin. Little children have no sin. And if you are uh, older and are converted to the church, it's because of the Holy Ghost that you are cleansed. Baptism is symbolic of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we bury the old person and we come forth a new man in Jesus Christ. That's the symbolism. Cleansing of sin comes through the Holy Ghost. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier whose divine mission is to burn dross and evil out of the human soul as though by fire, thus giving rise to the expression, baptism of fire, which is the baptism of the Spirit. Forgiveness is assured when we when the contrite soul receives the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit will not dwell in an unclean tabernacle. It is the Holy Spirit of God that eases carnal, erases carnality and brings us to a state of righteousness. We become clean when we actually receive the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Ghost. It is then that sin and dross and evil are burned out of our souls as though by fire. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is a baptism of fire. There have been miraculous occasions when visible flames envelop penitent persons, but ordinarily the cleansing power of the Spirit simply dwells unseen and unheralded in the hearts of those who have made the Lord their friend. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 20, the phrase, were baptized with fire in the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. 
In discussing the powerful spiritual side effects of the baptism of fire, the Savior used the faithful Lamanites as a prime example. Two important doctrinal points are seen in, this, in his brief statement about the conversion of the Lamanites. First, their spiritual rebirth came because of their faith in Christ. True repentance is based on and flows from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. President Ezra Taft Benson testified, There is no other way. Numerous scriptural passages likewise declare that the conversion, the baptism of fire, the mighty change of heart comes as a result of unwavering faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second doctrinal point is found in the phrase, and they knew it not. For most, this baptism of fire is experience ex fire experience is a continual process rather than a singular dramatic event. Quote, most repentance does not involve sensational or dramatic changes, President Ezra Taft Benson explained, quoting, but rather is a step-by-step -step steady and consistent movement towards godliness. He further counseled us not to become discouraged by expecting sensational spiritual experiences or by comparing our baptism by fire with experiences of those of others. We must be careful as we seek to become more and more godlike that we do not become discouraged and lose hope. Becoming Christ-like is a lifetime pursuit and very often involves growth and change and is almost imperceptible. End of quote. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, used this same scripture to express concern that the gift of the Holy Ghost is not recognized as it should be. He encouraged Latter-day Saints to cultivate the Spirit of the Holy Ghost and give counsel on how to recognize the Spirit. Quote, too many of us are like those whom the Lord said, Come with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And at the time of their conversion were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. Imagine that, and they knew it not. It is not unusual for one to have received the gift and not really know it. There are so many places to go, so many things to do in the noisy world. We can be too busy to pay attention to the promptings of the Spirit. End of quote. Let's now turn our attention to 3 Nephi, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. How oft will I have gathered you, if you will repent and return to me with full purpose of heart. Jesus is reminded that he had gathered and sheltered them in the past, as well as his many efforts to gather them that had been rebuffed, is not unique to the Nephites and Lamanites. He used similar language in Jerusalem as he lamented the impending destruction of the Jews. In our own day, he has given again used this phrase as a beckoning call to repentance and a warning of the consequences of rejecting his invitation. Not only has Christ repeatedly sought in the past to gather his flock, he will continue to seek to gather the children of men to him through the covenants of the restored gospel. Although he may seek to gather us home, we cannot be compelled into his protective arms of mercy. The promised spiritual blessings that attend such gathering are only realized on conditions of individual faith, repentance, submission to gospel blessings, and continued obedience and endurance, all of which are required in order for us to return to him with full purpose of heart. This work of gathering is the fundamental mission of the church and kingdom of God in the last days. To the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord declared, quote, For behold, I will gather them as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, if they will not harden their hearts. And if they will come, they may and partake of the waters of life freely. Later, the Lord more explicitly explained what is meant to be gathered to him, quote, And this is my gospel repentance and baptism by water then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost even the comforter and he that receiveth these things receiveth me and they shall be gathered unto me in time and in eternity end of quote President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency testified that the Savior will help those who are trying to come to him more than once he has said, this is a quote, he will gather us to him as a hen will gather her chicks under her wings. He says that we must choose to come to him and meet us and with enough faith in him to repent with full purpose of heart. 
One way to do that is together with the saints in his church. Go to your meetings, even when it seems hard. If you are determined, he will help you find the strength to do it. End of quote. I testify that is true, brothers and sisters. I struggle from a mental illness that many times it is very hard for me to be around large groups of people. But I put my trust and faith in God and still attend my meetings. And I have found that his grace is sufficient to help me endure such things. Chapter 10, verse 7. Your dwelling shall become desolate until the time of the fulfilling of the covenant of your fathers. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon and its being taken to the remnant of Lehi's seat and their acceptance of its teachings prepares the way for the lifting, the condemnation, and judgment that results from their ancestors' earlier rejection of Christ. Chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Upon learning of the fate of their kindred, the people again began mourning and weeping. But just as the vapors of darkness were dispersed by light, the darkness of their mourning was turned to the light of joy, as they more fully understood and experienced the mercy of the Lord. Their uncertainty and despair were dispelled with the fulfillment of the prophecies. Christ was resurrected. This segment of the historical account also provides a glimpse or foreshadowing of the glory of the second coming of Christ, which likewise will bring an end to death and destruction, and will replace mourning and lamentation with praises of thanksgiving and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Describing his glorious future events, Isaiah declared, He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord will will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Chapter 10, verse 12, the phrase, It was the more righteous part of the people who were saved, they who received the prophets. In direct contrast to the Lord's earlier statement concerning the wicked who had been destroyed, the Lord illuminates the saving attribute of the righteous. It was that they had received the prophets who had been sent among them. In our day, the Lord declared that the righteous, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, are those who hear and heed the Lord's chosen servants. Safety comes often comes when we follow the prophets. The Nephites who received the prophets were spared from greater destruction. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that we, like the Nephites, must follow our prophet if we hope to find safety, peace, prosperity, and happiness. Quote, it is no small thing, my brothers and sisters, to have a prophet of God in our midst. Great and wonderful are the blessings that come into our lives as we listen to the words of the Lord given to us through him. When we hear the counsel of the Lord expressed through the words of the President of the Church, our response should be positive and prompt. History shows that there is safety, peace, prosperity, and happiness in responding to prophetic counsel. End of quote. President Boyd K. Packer testified that blessings come to those who follow the prophet and warned of the consequences for rejecting them. On one, quote, quoting President Packer, on one occasion, Carl G. Mazur was leading a party of young missionaries across the Alps. As they reached the summit, he looked back and saw a row of sticks thrust in the snow to mark the one safe path across the otherwise treacherous glacier. Halting the company of missionaries, he gestured towards the sticks and said, Brethren, there stands the priesthood of God. They are just common sticks like the rest of us, but the position they hold makes them what they are to us. If we step aside from the path they mark, we are lost. Although no one of us is perfect, the church moves forward, led by ordinary people. The Lord promised, If my people will hearken unto my voice and to the voice of my servants whom I have appointed to lead my people, Behold, verily I say unto you, they shall not be moved out of their place. But if they will not hearken unto my voice, nor the voice of these men whom I have appointed, they shall not be blessed. I bear witness, brothers and sisters, that the leaders of the church were called of God by proper authority, and it is known to the church that they have the authority and have been properly ordained by the regularly ordained heads of the church. If we follow them, we will be saved. If we stray from them, we will surely 
be lost. End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 14. He that hath the scriptures, let him search them. The commandment to search the scriptures is again emphasized. Through searching the scriptures, we can have testimony strengthened by seeing the fulfillment of prophecy, can be instructed in righteousness, can come to know Christ more fully, and from the words of Christ, learn all things that we should do. Chapter 10, verse 15. Ye may have testified of these things at the coming of Christ. Elder Bruce R. McClucky stated, Is it any wonder that we both rejoice and tremble at what lies ahead? Truly the world is and will be in commotion, but the Zion of God will be unmoved. The wicked and ungodly shall be swept from the church, and the little stone will continue to grow until it fills the whole earth. The way ahead is dark and dreary and dreadful. There will be... Yet there will yet be martyrs. The doors in Carthage shall again enclose the innocent. We have not been promised that trials and evils of the world will entirely pass us by. If we as a people keep the commandments of God, if we take the side of the church in all issues, both religious and political, if we take the Holy Spirit for our guide, if we give heed to the words of the apostles and prophets who minister among us, then... From an eternal standpoint, all things will work together for our good. End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 18. In the ending of the thirty and fourth year, the signs of Christ's death came on the fourth day of the first month in the thirty-fourth year. Mormon here tells us that Christ appeared to the Nephites in the ending of the thirty-fourth year, just suggesting that it was several months following his old world ascension into heaven before he came. To the Nephites. We now turn our attention to 3 Nephi chapter 11. 11 verse 3, notwithstanding it being a small, a small voice, it did pierce them to the very soul and then cause their hearts to burn. The voice of God received through the spirit of revelation does not have to be heard with ears nor necessarily be transmitted by auditory nerves. It speaks to the soul of man. Hence, it can be a small voice, but can cause a person to quake or tremble. It is not volume, but rather the spiritual power of this small voice that makes it unique. Elder Dallin H. Oaks taught that the small voice that caused their hearts to burn was more of a feeling than a sound. The word burning in the scripture signifies a feeling of comfort and serenity. Serenity means warmth, gentleness, and calmness. Evidently, we do not produce those ourselves. Those are gifts of the Spirit. That's how we know the Spirit is talking to us when we have serenity, warmth, gentleness, and calmness, or in other words, peace. The Holy Ghost cannot duplicate the feeling of peace. I'm sorry, the saint cannot duplicate the feeling of peace. The Holy Ghost can give us peace. Just as the Nephites had to open their ears to hear the voice of God, President Boy K. Packer explained our need to pay attention so we might feel the gentle promptings of the Spirit. The voice of the Spirit Quote, the voice of the Spirit is described in the scriptures as being neither loud nor harsh. It is not a voice of thunder, neither a voice of great tumultuous noise, but rather a still voice of perfect mildness, as if it had been a whisper, and it can pierce even to the very soul and cause the heart to burn. Remember, Elijah found the voice of the Lord was not in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but was a still, small voice. That's why in our noisy world of wickedness and sin, we must take time for quietness and quiet reflection. The Spirit does not get our attention by shouting or shaking us with a heavy hand. Rather, it whispers. It caresses so gently that if we are preoccupied, we may not feel it at all. No wonder that the word of wisdom was revealed to us, for how could the drunkard or the addict feel such a voice? Occasionally it will press just firmly enough for us to pay heed, but most of the time, if we do not heed the gentle feelings, the spirit will withdraw. End of Elder Packer's quote. Chapter 11, verse 7. Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I have glorified my name. President Ezra Taft Benson smoke of the rare experience of hearing the voice of Heavenly Father. 
How few people in all the history of the world have heard the actual voice of God the Father speaking to them. As the people looked toward heavenward, they saw a man descending out of heaven, and he was clothed in a white robe, and he came down and stood in the midst of them. A glorious resurrected being, a member of the Godhead, the creator of innumerable worlds, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, stood before their very eyes. End of quote. And one day that will happen again. Our turn will come to see the Savior with our very eyes. On another occasion, the voice of the Father had been heard introducing his Son and commanding his people to hearken to the words of the Son. This introduction is unique in that it adds the phrase, In whom I have glorified my name. No doubt this has reference to Christ's fulfillment of the atoning sacrifice that makes immortality and eternal life possible for mankind, which is the work and glory of the Father. Chapter 11, verses 8 through 17. This is the crowning spiritual event in the Book of Mormon. Words cannot adequately describe the thoughts and feelings that must have filled the minds and hearts of those present at the temple in Bountiful. It is doubtfully significant to note that what, what the Savior did as he appeared to the people and for what purpose he did it. He taught and testified of himself. He is the Christ, the Messiah, who every prophet had testified would come into the world. The bitter cup, which is the symbolic representation of the painful demands of justice that had to be met in order for the infinite and eternal sacrifice to be fulfilled, had been drunk. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency taught that following the Savior's example during hardship help during the Savior's example, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, first taught that following the Savior's example during hardship helps us endure our own personal bitter cups. Many members in drinking of the bitter cup that has come to them wrongfully think that this cup, this cup, passes by others. In his first words to the people of the Western continent, Jesus of Nazareth poignantly spoke of the bitter cup of the Father had given him. Every soul has some bitterness to swallow. Parents have a child who loses his way, come to know of his sorrow. That defies description. A woman whose husband is cruel or insensitive can have her heart broken every day. Members who do not marry may suffer sorrow and disappointment. Having drunk the bitter cup, however, there comes a time when one must accept the situation as it is and reach upward and outward. President Harold Beely said, Do not let self-pity or despair beckon you from the course you know is right. The Savior set the compass. We must be born again in spirit and heart. End of quote. Standing before the people was the glorious evidence that the promise of redemption was now realized. No object lesson or teaching method could teach these doctrinal truths more powerfully than seeing the resurrected Lord himself and hearing him declare with his own mouth these saving truths. It was not enough just to declare to the people that the infinite and eternal sacrifice had been made in their behalf. The Savior next demonstrated his infinite love and compassion by inviting every person present to come forth and fill the prince of the nails. I'm sorry, that's of the nails. Of the nails, this sacred procession must have taken several hours as each of the 2,500 people saw with their eyes and felt with their own hands the living Christ. Jesus lovingly, patiently, and tenderly stood there allowing so many to handle him and to praise his holy name, not because he desired or needed to be the focus of their worship, adoration, but rather because he desired them to gain an apostolic witness of his divinity that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world was his stated objective. And one day we will have that opportunity to also have that witness. Chapter 11, verse 14, I am the God of Israel. The resurrected Jesus whom the Nephites heard and saw was and is the same Jehovah who was seen and heard by Moses and other ancient prophets. He is the great I Am, the Holy One of Israel, the Shepherd of Israel. To Moses on Sinai he gave the law which pointed men to its fulfillment in him in Gethsemane and on Golgotha. He is both the lawgiver and the fulfillment of the law. Perhaps no more clearly and profoundly is 
it taught anywhere that Jesus Christ was and is a God, pre-mortal, mortally, and post-mortally, then in the Book of Mormon. As he stands before the Nephites, we do not see him merely as a great moral teacher or prophet, neither is he described as our elder brother, but truly and literally as the God of Israel, the very God in heaven who Abinadi said would come down among the children of man and redeem him from his people. Brothers and sisters, we are long past Christ being our elder brother. He is our very God, our very eternal heavenly Father of our spiritual bodies and the resurrection. We are his begotten sons and daughters, children of Christ. Chapter 11, verses 14 through 15. The wounds in his hands and feet and side. When the resurrected Lord appeared to the Nephites, he invited them to fill the wounds in his hands and feet and side so they could witness his resurrection. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught that Jesus Christ's mortal wounds are tokens of his sacrifice. Quote, However dim our days may seem, they have been a lot darker for the Savior of the world. As a reminder of those days, Jesus has chosen, even in a resurrected, otherwise perfect body, to retain for the benefit of his disciples the wounds in his hands, in his feet, and in his side. Signs, if you will, that painful things happen even to the pure and perfect. Signs, if you will, that pain in this world is not evidence that God doesn't love you. Signs, if you will, that promises that problems pass and happiness can be ours. Remind others that it is the wounded Christ who is the captain of our souls, who, who yet bears the scars of our forgiveness, the lesions of his love and humility, the torn flesh of obedience and sacrifice. These wounds are principally, are, are the principal way we are to recognize him when he comes. He may invite us forward as he invited others to see and to fill those marks. If not before, then surely at, the, at that time we will remember with Isaiah that it was for us that a God was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. End of quote. Chapter 7, 11, verse 17, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High. The word Hosanna in Hebrew literally means save now, save we pray. It is taken from a messianic psalm found in the Old Testament, Psalms 118.25. It was commonly used in ancient times in connection with the worship of Jehovah at the Feast of Tabernacles. Shouting hosannas and waving palm branches was a means of worshiping the Messiah and acknowledging his saving power. No doubt the Nephites were familiar with this conceptual meaning of hosanna. Evidently, the people were asking the Savior to teach them the way to salvation. Thus, it is not surprising that he immediately teaches them the basic principles and ordinances of the gospel. But what is most important in this verse is that the people were so overcome with love and gratitude that they worshipped the very person for whom these ancient hosannas had been reserved. In the modern church, also, the hosanna shout is used as a sacred means of worshipping the Lord and expressing our profound respect, love, and gratitude for him and his holy mission. The modern proclamations of Hosanna are usually reserved for deeply sacred events, such as temple dedications. Whether done anciently or today, it is a symbol of deep reverence for the for and worship of our Lord. Chapter 11, verse 18. He spoke, he spake unto Nephi, and he commanded him that he should come forth. It is evident from this passage that Nephi, as a humble servant of the Lord, had not sought special privileges with the Savior, nor was he at the head of the line to meet the Savior. Mormon's wording is evidence of Nephi's humility. He was among the multitude. Jesus called him forth to, one, instruct Nephi in his duties as the moral head of the, church, of the Nephite church, and two, to demonstrate to the people who the Lord anointed was. This was in a manner of setting apart of Nephi as the Savior's authorized servant among the Nephites. Chapter 11, verse 19, bowed himself before the Lord and did kiss his feet. Those who have served the Master most faithfully and have hearkened to his words most closely are the ones who know him most intimately. 
Nephi's gesture of worship, as described by Mormon, gives us a small glimpse of the love and adoration that Nephi had for his Savior. His entire ministry is one of testifying of Christ and teaching his people to return to Christ. Now he was able to personally worship the only begotten as an eyewitness of the resurrection. What greater reward could there be for a faithful follower and disciple of Christ? Perhaps we can better understand not only Nephi's actions, but also his innermost feelings when we read the words of a modern-day special witness of the Savior. Demonstrating a Nephite-like love for the intimate knowledge of the resurrected Christ, Elder Bruce R. McConkie declared, quote, I am one of his witnesses, and in a coming day I shall fill the nail marks in his hands and in his feet, and shall wet his feet with my tears. But I shall not know any better than, than, than I know now that he is God's almighty Son, that he is our Savior and Redeemer, and that salvation comes in and through his atoning blood, and in no other way. It was just a few weeks, I believe, or a month or so after this testimony that Elder Bruce McConkie passed away from cancer. Chapter 11, verses 21 through 27, the importance of baptism. Reading these verses, one may wonder why Nephi did not already have priesthood authority and whether the ordinance of baptism was not already being practiced among the Nephites. The answers to both questions would be yes. Nephi already had authority and baptism was already being practiced. The doctrinal significance of these verses is not merely to reiterate the importance of baptism by the proper priesthood authority, but rather to demonstrate the establishment of a new gospel dispensation among the Nephites and the accompanying ordination and ordinances that a new dispensation necessitates. Of the events described in these verses, President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, There is nothing strange in the fact that when the Lord came to the Nephites, Nephi was baptized, and so was everybody else, although they had been baptized before. The church among the Nephites before the coming of Christ was not in its fullness and was under the law of Moses. The Savior restored the fullness and gave them all the ordinance and blessings of the gospel. Therefore, it actually became a new organization, and through baptism they came into it. We have a similar condition in this dispensation. The prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were baptized by the command of the angel John the Baptist. Several others were baptized before the organization of the church. However, on the day the church was organized, all who had been previously baptized were baptized again, not for the remission of sins, but for entrance into the church. In each case, the reason was the same. End of quote. President Boyd K. Packer explained the significance of baptism and cautioned that we should not alter this sacred ordinance. Quote, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins is the first ordinance. Baptism must be by immersion for it is symbolic of both the coming forth from temporal death from the grave and the cleansing required for redemption from spiritual death. Under the plan, baptism is not just for entrance in the church of Jesus Christ. It begins a spiritual rebirth that may eventually lead us back into his presence. So there we are seeing taught this, the true symbolism of baptism, the death and then the spiritual rebirth of a person in Christ, his death and resurrection. We come forth out of the baptismal waters promising to be a new person in Christ. If we really understood, continuing his quote, what baptism signifies, we could never consider it trivial nor alter the form of its sacred ordinance. Through the sacrament, we renew the covenant. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 26. And then shall ye immerse them in the water. The practice of baptism by complete immersion did not begin in Christ's mortal ministry, but his rich symbolism is based on the death burial, and resurrection of Christ. In the old world, Paul spoke often of the spiritual symbols associated with immersion. While we have no record teaching of this symbolism in the Book of Mormon, the ancient Nephites undoubtedly had been taught and understood it. Perhaps it was once again taught by the Savior himself as he now instructed them concerning the manner of baptism. Chapter 11, verse 27, The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one. See Alma 1144. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one, not in physical being as Son may claim, but rather in the sense of the dictionary definition, single through union 
agreement, harmony of a single kind, nature, or character, a state of unity, agreement, accord. Each member of the Godhead is unique and separate with his own important missions, and yet they are totally united in the purpose of bringing mankind to immortality and eternal life. The Savior himself spoke of this kind of oneness that characterized the Godhead when he prayed to his Father that the apostles may be one as we are. He was not praying that the disciples become one in physical being, but rather they might become completely unified in purpose. We too become one with God when, through faith and obedience, we become like them. When our thoughts and words and deeds are in total accord with those of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Chapter 11, verse 28, There shall be no disputations among you. The record does not identify the issue or the doctrines that were previously being disputed among the people. All we know is that there had been disputations over doctrine. What is doctrinally significant from this passage is not the nature or cause of the contention, but rather that the Lord was extremely displeased with it. It is especially offensive to the Lord when there is conflict over his doctrines, in light of his reminder that we must be one if we are to be his disciples. The Savior's ancient injunction still has spiritual significance today. Alert Russell M. Nelson declared, that, quote, The divine doctrine of the church is the prime target of attack by the spiritually contentious, dissecting doctrine in a controversial way in order to draw attention to oneself is not pleasing to the Lord. Contention fosters disunity. What can we do to combat this canker of contention? What steps may each of us take to supplant the spirit of contention with the spirit of personal peace? To begin, show compassionate concern for others. Control the tongue, the pen, and the word processor. Whenever tempted to dispute, remember this proverb, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Through the love of God, the pain caused by the fiery canker of contention will be extinguished from the soul. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 29, the spirit of contention is of the devil who is the father of contention. Contention and conflict is the antithesis of peace and love promised by the Lord. Satan is the father of contention in that he seeks to stir up men to anger so that the spirit of the Lord cannot be with them. In the premortal world, Lucifer was the father, the creator, the source of contention that has now spread to the earth. It matters not to Satan what the contention is all about, whether it is about worldly wickedness or the doctrines of the kingdom. It only matters that contention and conflict be created in the beings of men, because it is a corroding canker of the spirit that, unless checked by repentance, can lead to spiritual death. Since Lucifer seeks the destruction of all men and uses anger, strife, and contention as a weapon that can thwart the works of the Spirit in our lives, it is no wonder the Savior commanded his disciples to eliminate anger from their lives. President Henry B. Iron helps us understand that the Spirit of God will not lead people, will not lead people into contention. Quote, where people have the Spirit with them, we may expect harmony. The Spirit puts the testimony of truth in our hearts, which unifies those who share that testimony. The Spirit of God never generates contention. It never generates the feelings of distinction between people which lead to strife. It leads to personal peace and feelings of union with others. It unifies souls. A unified family, a unified church, a world at peace depends on unified souls. End of quote. President Thomas S. Monson shared a story illustrating the blessings that come from avoiding contention. After reading 3 Nephi 11, 28-30, he said, quote, Let me conclude with an account of two men who are heroes to me. Their acts of courage are not performed on a national scale, but rather in a peaceful valley known as Midway, Utah. Long years ago, Roy Kohler and Grant Riemann served together in church capacities. They were the best of friends. They were tillers of the soil and dairymen. Then a misunderstanding arose which became somewhat of a rift between them. Later, when Roy Kohler became grievously ill with cancer and had but a limited time to live, my wife Frances and I visited Roy and his wife, and I gave him a blessing. As we talked afterwards, Brother Kohler said, let me tell you about one of the sweetest experiences I have had during my life. He then recounted to me his misunderstanding with Grant Riemann and the ensuing estrangement. 
His comment was, we were sort of on the outs with each other. Then, continuing Roy, continued Roy, I had just put up our hay for the winter to come when one night, as a result of spontaneous combustion, the hay caught fire, burning the hay, the barn, and everything in its right to the ground. It was devastating, said Roy. I don't know what in the world I would do. The night was dark except for the dying embers of the fire. Then I saw coming towards me from the road in the direction of Grant Riemann's place the lights of tractors and heavy equipment as the rescue party turned into our drive and met me amidst my tears. Grant said, Roy, you have got quite a mess to clean up. My boys and I are here. Let's get to it. Together they plunged to the task at hand. Gone forever was the hidden wedge which had separated them for a short time. They worked throughout the night into the next day with many others in the community joining in. Roy Kohler had passed away and Grant Riemann is getting older. Their sons have served together in the same word bishopric. I truly treasure the friendship of these two wonderful families. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 30. This is not my doctrine to stir up the hearts of men with anger. There is no place in the Savior's gospel, whether it be in the church, our homes, our neighborhoods, or the workplace, for contention and anger. We can defend the faith, declare the truth, and love the gospel without contention. Disputations and anger, even the noblest of causes, is displeasing to the Lord, cuts us off from the Spirit of the Lord, and undermines the very purposes we are seeking to fulfill. As we strive to more fully live the Savior's teachings, we will discover in our place, our lives more peace and less contention, more peacemaking, mutual respect and understanding, and less disputation and conflict. The peace that will eventually cover the earth must first start within individual lives. Chapter 11, verses 31 through 41. I will declare unto you my doctrine. The Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. While it does not contain all the gospel teachings or practices of the modern church, it nevertheless contains the fullness of the gospel in that it contains the Savior's own teachings of what constitutes his doctrine or gospel. Nephi and his brother Jacob had previously taught and testified of those teachings and ordinances that comprised the doctrine of Christ. Faith, repentance, baptism by water and by fire, enduring and faithfulness to the end, keeping the commandments and following the example of the Savior. These are all integral components of the doctrine of Christ. All of the prophets have testified of these same principles and ordinances that are central to the plan of salvation. With his appearance to the Nephites at Bountiful, the resurrected Lord personally reiterated these principles. These verses in chapter 11 become the foundation for his subsequent teaching of the gospel and preparing the people to live a life of higher righteousness. Here the Savior enumerates the principles and ordinances of his gospel, but later he expounded further on how each principle is linked to the other, how all are appendages to the atoning sacrifice of the only begotten, and how together they constitute the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Chapter 11, verse 32, The doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. Are we commonly speak of the doctrine or gospel of Jesus Christ, this verse clearly teaches that the gospel, the plan of salvation, was not originated by Jesus, but is indeed the Father's. Paul spoke of the gospel of God concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Elder Bruce L. McConkie taught, quote, What is the gospel? In the full and eternal sense, it is the plan of salvation ordained and established by the Father to enable his spirit children, Christ included, to advance and progress and become like him. Thus, it includes all things, both temporal and spiritual, and is as eternal as God himself. Every truth, every eternal verity, every law and power, whether on earth, in heaven, or throughout the boundless universe, all of these are part of the gospel. He is their source and author, and all that is has been created for the benefit and blessing of man. To us, the essential thing is the plan of salvation. In the plan of salvation is the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Accordingly, we speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He adopted his Father's plan to center our attention everlastingly in the one by whom salvation comes. It is God's gospel and it is Christ's gospel. And if we believe and obey its truths and laws and play our significant parts in the divine system, it becomes our gospel also. End of quote. 
chapter 11, verse 33, they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. In the context of this verse, we see that faith in Christ and the ordinance of baptism, both by water and by fire, are required for entrance into the celestial kingdom. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, the prophet Joseph Smith declared. This eternal truth settles the question of all men's religion. A man may be saved in the terrestrial kingdom or in the telestial kingdom, but he can never see the celestial kingdom without being born of water and the Spirit. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Chapter 11, verse 34, And whosoever is not baptized shall be damned. Those who reject the principle of the gospel, including the ordinance of baptism, are damned, not in the fiery and brimstone, brimstone sense, but rather in the sense that their progression is stopped. Their joy is limited because they are not in the celestial kingdom. The only place there is a continuation of seed forever and ever. There are varying degrees of damnation, just as there are varying degrees of meaning of salvation. In this sense, all who do not attain exaltation are damned, even though they are redeemed and inherit lesser rewards, with the exception of sons of perdition and subjects in many cases to long delays in spirit prison to allow repentance and reform of those who shall not be redeemed from the devil until the last resurrection. All shall ultimately enjoy a glory hereafter which suppress all, which shall surpass, surpass all understanding. Chapter 11, verse 36, the Holy Ghost will bear record unto him of the Father in me. The Holy Ghost is God the third, the witness or testator. While there are numerous functions and spiritual blessings of the Holy Ghost, the primary mission of that member of the Godhead is to bear witness to the Father and the Son and to test, teach and testify of their plan of salvation. Chapter 11, verse 37 to 38, become as a little child, or you can no wise receive these things or ye can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. The natural man cannot comprehend the things of God, and as a result cannot embrace the saving principles and ordinances of the gospel. Becoming as a little child in order to receive the teachings of the Savior implies overcome the natural man through the atonement of Jesus Christ. This requirement to become as a little child, to enter into the kingdom of God, means much more than childlike innocence. It implies a submission to the will of the Father and a recognition of our total dependency upon the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 40. Whosoever shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil. After completing his sermon on what constitute his doctrine and the means whereby salvation is attained, the Savior issued this sharp warning concerning those, either in the church or without, who would seek to alter the teachings of Christ and declare such alterations as truth. To the Galatian saints, the Apostle Paul issued a similar caution. Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him. That should be from. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another. But be there, but there be some that trouble you and would prevent the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preaching the other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Well, I still haven't fixed that from, did I? There we go. Elder Bruce R. McConkie comments on this passage from Galatians also helps to illuminate the meaning of the Savior's warning to the Nephites, quote, that there is and could be only one gospel, one church, one plan of salvation, one true religion is as self-evident as any truth known to man. There can be no more two, two true gospels or two true churches, and there can be true two different scientific facts. Truth is truth, and truth and salvation in the gospel all are ordained of God. They are what they are, and they are not what they are not. Men either have the truth of salvation or they do not. They either possess the gospel, which is the plan of salvation, or they do not. Anyone in heaven or on earth in the time or eternity, in Paul's day or ours, anyone who preaches any gospel other than the true one is accursed. Why? Because there is no salvation in a false religion. 
there is no saving power in a man-made system of salvation. And any man, whether mortal or immortal, whether man or angel, who preaches any system other than the very one ordained by deity, leads men astray and keeps them from gaining salvation. That should be leads. True, um, <clears throat> and who is a false teacher, a false minister, a false prophet? Anyone who does not teach the truth, minister the elements of true religion, or prop prophesy truly of what is yet to be. It is true, pure diamond truth that comes and nothing else. A true preacher is one who belongs to the true church, believes the true gospel, holds that priesthood, which is, in fact, the power of God delegated to man on earth, and who receives revelation from the one true spirit being who is the Holy Ghost, and woe unto all others, for they shall fall under the eternal law, here announced by one who was a legal administrator, and who wrote by the power of the Spirit. End of quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that helped you with the doctrines and principles, great principles of salvation, the doctrines of Christ, and what we must do to be considered the righteous. If this helped you, please hit the like button.